evening and welcome to the sixth annual Facing Race Ambassador Awards event. Let's give a round of applause to Fodi Bangura and Dunia Drum and Dance for opening the celebration tonight. <laughs> Woo! I'm Carlene Rhodes with the St. Paul Foundation. I'm very happy to be here with you in celebration of leaders who are working to create communities that are free of racism, rich in culture, and sustained by opportunities for all. The racial equity work that many of you do often goes unnoticed, so let's change that tonight. Please take a moment to look around, greet a neighbor, and thank them for the work they're doing to fight racism, and thank them for being here to celebrate those who are fighting racism. The people who are here tonight to celebrate the 2012 Ambassador Awards knows that racism exists and that has a profoundly negative impact on Minnesota communities. While we can't undo the harm that's been caused by racism in the past, we can take action to eliminate racism from our future. And it's work that must be done if we're going to positively change the nature of personal, organizational, and institutional responses to race and racism. I'd like to share a short video with you that illustrates the critical need for this work in Minnesota. When you start to look at disparities, when you start to look at the experiences of one group versus another group, when you contrast, compare and contrast, you see that those aspects of you know, graffiti and or racial slurs I think those, those are just symptoms. The media focuses on the, uh, on the extremes. What gets lost is a lot of the layers of complexity in how those things came about and how they impact all of us. I am concerned about the, the racial gap, the equity gap, the uh, gap in, in achievement and opportunity. We still have young people coming to school and, and not seeing themselves in the schools that they attend, in the communities they live in. Kids of, kids of color aren't being um, enveloped into the fabric of the core group that moves along and graduates and becomes productive citizens in our society. It's like we have a tolerance for um, this achievement gap. We're at a pivotal point right now because there are two roads we can take. We can take the road that will lead to apathy and exclusion, or we can take a road towards proficiency and prosperity. The Facing Race Anti-Racism Initiative of the St. Paul Foundation provides tools and resources so that individuals and communities can address racism. We provide an opportunity for com communities to come together and have difficult conversations about this issue. We support nonprofits to increase their ability to address racism and disparities, and we celebrate and honor others in the community doing anti-racism work. What Facing Race does is it allows for the dialogue to take place, and it is the catalyst to move towards a different place. I applaud the St. Paul Foundation for taking that on and for actually, it, for putting um, you know, some action behind it and some resources behind it. It's making it so accessible to so many different community members and community groupings in a way that may not have been touched if it weren't for the work that the foundation is doing. Yeah, I was struck by um, quite a few of the comments in the video when I first saw it, but one that really stuck out for me was the one that community activist Xavier Bell made. And he was talking about the pivotal point that we're at with two roads ahead of us and a chance to pick one of those two roads. And I know we all agree that the road we take going, down, going into the future has to lead to more proficiency for everyone and prosperity for all as well. You heard a bit in the um, video about the St. Paul Foundation's Facing Race Initiative. 
Um, we offer tools and resources that help individuals and communities talk about racism, think about it, and explore their own personal position. Facing Race is also our platform for lifting up and celebrating the work of anti-racism leaders. Here to help us honor them tonight is Bemidji State University Professor of Ojibwe, Dr. Anton Troyer. Anton is an educational bridge builder and a cultural preservationist. He's working to restore the Ojibwe language as a means of healing the wounds of racism. He's a prolific author with nine published works, some that you saw in the lobby. He actually is um, going to be willing to sign books if you bought them ahead of time or you buy them after the program, um, including his latest, Everything You Wanted to Know About Indians But Were Afraid to Ask. He provided the Ojibwe translations featured throughout our program. And if you attended this event last year, you may remember that Dr. Troyer was one of the 2011 Ambassador Award honorees. Well, great, we are grateful to have him back with us tonight. Um, Bushu, Dr. Troyer. How buju, migwe chapijigi pijaego ma, apijigo, nijishin you owe, Asia chigeg, minuago, we weni we maduan bungigo, you owe, sir, and end the maduaj gage chigang and digikamang you owe, sir, and end the mang we weni, sir, the minnow, do down draga, canon go be madzijig. Ninda shween wagosh, indigo, minua, migizi, and do de, Gazaga squadji make cargage in a car de Ushkonigan, iwidi wange bayan. English? They told me I had to give a keynote address. They did not say that it had to be in English. <laughs> and I'm always telling the uh, president and deans at Bemidji State University that if anybody calls and asks for the Department of Foreign Languages, to be sure to direct them to the English department. <clears throat> I am really, really honored and excited to be here tonight. I get a lot of energy and a big battery charge from being around so many people who care so deeply and are working so hard, many devoting their entire lives to addressing the issues of race and inequality and are working to make our country a better place. And it's moments like this where I really see and feel a lot of hope. When we look, uh, and I guess as we get uh, an opportunity like this, we can look back and see how far we've come in addressing race in this nation. And we have come far. Some of these things are pretty obvious. You know, the end to slavery or genocide, progress with the civil rights movement, uh, even legislative things like the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, uh, constitutional protections uh, for minorities often affirmed. Uh, and then we can see people of many races ascending to positions of academic power, um, political power, including our current President of the United States, uh, and also rising in the ranks of economic prosperity. Uh, we can also see often attitudinal maturation around race in many, many ways. But at the same time that we have seen a lot of progress, we have to remember that there is still a long way to go. On the one hand, here's the things we were just talking about in progress. Yes, we've ended slavery, but we still have a major issue with human trafficking. And genocide is still prevalent in many parts of the world. We've got issues with gerrymandering. I've got a friend named uh, Damien Badboy who actually was living in a reservation community trying to run a sweat lodge and was continually uh, prohibited because his lodge was violating city building codes, fire codes, and noise codes. That's for a Native American living on an Indian reservation. We got ways to go. Uh, we've seen, of course, uh, more recently also the uh, problems with uh, law in Arizona that's banning the teaching of ethnic studies in K-12 institutions. And there are many, many things we could say about that law. It actually says that uh, it is prohibited to have any program that is designed to teach exclusively about one race of people. <laughs> but by jettisoning ethnic studies, the law is in direct contradiction to itself because 
white is a race too. There are, there are constitutional issues that may even be successfully challenged in court, but I think it raises some fundamental questions about where we are on race, what the actions and reactions are around race. And I mean, Arizona can be a kind of strange place. There's also a law there that says racial profiling is okay. If somebody looks like they're an illegal immigrant, pull them over and check. And they're also the only state that said we will not celebrate Martin Luther King Day. Chris Rock kind of nailed that one on the head when he said, how racist do you have to be to turn down a day off from work just because it's honoring a man who happens to be black. <laughs> but it's not just Arizona. It's many places in many ways where we can look and see that we have lots of work to do. And even though our Constitution charges the Supreme Court with protecting minorities from the tyranny of the majority in just those terms, we can see many examples where that hasn't happened. And we have to think, you know, looking ahead to the future, even Minnesota, home of good Scandinavian Lutherans, is projected to have a white minority population after 2040. Maybe when white people are the minority, the importance of protecting minorities from the tyranny of the majority will be more important to everybody. We can see so many ways in which, you know, Indians, for example, are often imagined but infrequently well understood. I think most Americans have gotten a sugar-coated version of Christopher Columbus in the first Thanksgiving and, and precious little other information to more deeply understand the first people of the land. And with just about any racial group you want to look at, there's plenty of work for us to do in reforming everything from no child left behind to state mandated curriculum guidelines to the way that we implement that, teach that, and prepare our teachers. So sometimes attitudinal growth seems slow and scattershot, and sometimes those economic opportunities are slow in developing too. You know, uh, way back BC, that's before a casino, <laughs> the unemployment rate for Native Americans was around 50%, 50 percent, five zero. And we, when we had a sustained unemployment rate of 15 percent, we called it the Great Depression. And we got a massive intervention, Social Security and Medicare, Medicaid, all kinds of programs. Well, now after casino, the unemployment rate has fallen in Indian country all the way down to an average of 20%. That's before the most recent recession. And some of the communities like Red Lake in northwestern Minnesota still has a 37% unemployment rate. States like South Dakota, uh, which have already said statewide gaming and gambling is legal, uh, have seen communities like Pine Ridge with an 85% unemployment rate. Now that Great Depression, well, for Native Americans, that started in the 1800s, and it has never ended. We're still waiting for our intervention. And I think when you look at many different races, you will see really troubling disparities that we all need to be concerned about. I'm going to roll through a couple of pictures, and I, I really don't even have to say a lot about this, but I think the picture says it all. The date is probably the most significant thing, maybe to a lesser degree, the location. This is a picture uh, at a protest against Native American treaty rights in Wisconsin. You've got the caption, Spear an Indian, save a walleye. There was another sign there that said, uh, save two walleye, spear a pregnant squaw. So if we're tempted to think that we've really solved racism, sometimes even the most overt forms are still quite prevalent. As of today's date, there are still six southern states that incorporate the stars and bars in their state flags. And, you know, the South is a strange place. You know, I know that there are plenty of people there who still call the Civil War the War of Northern Aggression. And whose great-great-grandpappy died in that war? It's an emotionally charged subject. At the same time, you know, 
that Southern hospitality is for real, that politeness and chivalry. But it raises for me the question, how could something like incorporating the stars and bars into state flags, which is obviously just completely rude, be so tolerated? Yeah, my people died because of that flag, so did mine. You know, there are so many obvious examples. This issue with Native Americans being used as mascots for sport teams, I think is one that just has to go. And I look forward to a day, and I actually believe we'll eventually get there, hopefully within my lifetime. A day when we can look back at this kind of the way we look back at segregated water fountains and say, how could we have ever tolerated or defended that? You know, I, I understand a natural resistance to political correctness, and maybe on a certain level we should all resist the idea of, you know, kind of conforming just because everybody else is about any issue. But at the same time, you know, the definition of racism is the differential and negative treatment of any group of people based upon race, and Native Americans as the only race used as a mascot for a sport team is, is an example of racism. And I don't think that resistance to political correctness should ever be allowed to enable racism to triumph over reason or common sense. And clearly that's what's happening. I have limited time and there's a lot more I could say on that, but remember too that those who say that use of this mascot is honoring Native Americans, that number one, a lot of Native Americans don't truly feel honored, uh, but number two, every opposing team will by definition be defiling their opponent's mascots in the name of school and team spirit, which is why at the recent game between the UMD Bulldogs and the Fighting Sioux, the opposing fans were chanting slay the squaws and smallpox blankets, smallpox blankets. And how am I supposed to feel good about bringing my kids to that game? And remember too that, you know, people of any race and people of every race can be blind to the issues or tolerate and enable these institutions and problems to persist. The overwhelming majority of professional football players are black, and an increasingly large number of announcers and coaches are also black. And I'm still waiting for them to raise their voices. Now, this is from uh, St. Paul, just a few blocks away, back at Thanksgiving in 2010. And one of the local bars had this poster up and disseminated on Facebook and so forth. Now, there are lots of problems, you know. You got the Indian guy passed out, he can't really handle his drink. You got the white guy who's a, a happy drunk. You have this lady here who, I don't think I know her. <laughs> but you know, most crime in America is black on black and white on white and so forth. One of the exceptions is crimes of sexual violence against Native women, which are predominantly perpetrated by white men. So the sexual objectification of Native women is also an issue in this poster. Lots of stuff. You know, after 500 years, looking at the Christopher Columbus thing, I won't bother reading this whole um, speech, which was given by uh, George Bush the Elder at the time, but I think the highlighted words say a lot. You know, momentous year in history, greatest achievements of human endeavor, discovery, new world. I mean, really, how can you discover a place that's densely inhabited by other human beings? Set an example for us all. Monumental feats, perseverance, faith, support the quincentenary. Why is it hard, so hard, after 500 years to say, Something bad happened. You know, our country was founded on genocidal policies towards the first inhabitants of the land, the enslavement of black people, and these things are morally repugnant, and I say this because I love my country.
And if we really want to get to truth and reconciliation, it's got to start with truth. You know, there's a lot we could say. We won't have time to really break down what really happened on Columbus's second voyage. But, you know, here's a drawing. This accompanied a, a book by Bartolome de las Casas, and the first English edition of the book showed this, this image here, which is on the island of Española, what we now know of as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Uh, the Spanish instituted a gold dust tribute and chopped the hands off of people who failed to bring gold dust to the Spanish authorities. There were lots of problems. Uh, including the fact that most of the gold the Spanish observed had been uh, obtained in trade from mainland Mexico and was not easily obtained by the native inhabitants. They chopped the hands off of 30,000 people. Within 30 years, what the Spanish estimated at an indigenous population of 2 million people just on that island was reduced to around 25,000. And the remaining population died off, killed off, or absorbed into the general population. That is genocide. And by the way, Columbus, his scribes, army officers, missionaries kept very detailed notes and journals. There is no disputing that this actually happened. And the biggest question is not what happened, but why after 500 years have we so often taught and been taught this picture? Indian! Chris! This land is your land, this land is my land. It's a darn fine question. Because it's one thing to turn a blind eye, and it's another thing to try to totally rewrite history. By the way, some of those ugly chapters have not just you know, been ignored or sugar-coated, but sometimes they've even been celebrated now, Minnesota and Wisconsin at one point were all together as one territory. And this is an image of the great seal of the territory of Wisconsin. There's a picture of an Indian here. There's a little feather headdress. There's a steamship. Those of you who don't know uh, the history of the Ho-Chunk, otherwise known as Winnebago Indians, they endured nine separate relocation orders and were moved to a number of places in Minnesota, and then eventually boarded on a steamship, sent down the Mississippi and up the Missouri to Santee, Nebraska. So this image seems to speak to the removal of native people from the land. You have the, the white farmer industriously plowing the land, the state capital looming in the background, and then there's a caption in Latin that says, civilization succeeds barbarism. Wow. With their sesquicentennial, they have, you know, revamped even the Wisconsin state seal. It's far more benign. But let's take a look as these ideas that informed our own Minnesota state seal came into being. Now, they will tell you different things. And by the way, every child in our state has to learn about the state seal. It's mandated in the curriculum guidelines. You got the Indian, and he's riding west into the sunset. Last of the Dakota last of the Ojibwe, fill in the blank with whatever tribe you want. Dakota and Ojibwe being the original indigenous groups in Minnesota. You also have the white farmer industriously plowing the land with his wary eye on the Indian. You have, it's a little hard to see here, there's an ax and a gun. I see the implements of deforestation and physical violence. The caption's in French, l'étoile du Nord, the star of the north. As a matter of perspective, you know, I could share this story where I, I went to Germany and Austria and I said, I want to see some concentration camps. And so I went looking for Dachau, which is a concentration camp outside the city of Munich. No road signs till you're about a kilometer away. I went looking for Mauthausen, which is in Austria. No road signs till you're about maybe two kilometers away. You go looking for Auschwitz in Poland, then your signs are 175 kilometers and 150 and 50, 25, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Look what the Nazis did to us. Now, no individual human being wants to be judged by their darkest day. I don't. No nation wants to be judged by their darkest day. Right? And let's face it, it's a pretty fine question. How did the most well-educated and the most literate society in the world come up with the final solution. 
To address these things in Germany, they had to do things like make apologies, reparations. Even the Swiss banks had to make reparations for the gold that was minted into coin extracted from fillings from Holocaust victims. Ick. And there had to be mandated instruction about it across the curriculum. And that has still not purged white supremacy and neo-Nazism in Germany. But it helps mitigate the chances of that happening again, to create awareness, again, truth, then reconciliation. Here in America, we have yet to get to, you know, the formal apologies, the reparations, and the mandated instruction. We still have a lot of work to do. And I do think this is the way to go. By the way, you know, I think South Africa shows us a pretty good effort at truth and reconciliation. Doesn't mean it has fixed all the problems, but it's a start. Canada has issued a formal apology for the residential boarding school experience for Native people there, and has actually instituted a policy by which those who document um, physical and sexual abuse can receive uh, compensation for that. It's the start, not the end. But I think we can see other examples of this dynamic. And let's face it, if you get a situation where maybe, let's say there's a husband and a wife, and the man goes out and cheats on his wife, and then wants to reconcile the relationship, it cannot start with, hey, forget about it. That all happened in the past. You know, it's got to start with, I am so sorry, and I'd done you wrong. And it's never going to happen again. And then you got your 10% chance to reconcile that relationship. <laughs> I think many people of color are ready to reconcile. And the problem with racism is that, you know, someone's been pounding us in the head with a hammer for a really long time and setting down the hammer and saying, you know, forget about it. That's all in the past. Nobody's hitting you in the head with a hammer, but you still got this horrible wound called historical trauma. And then every time somebody passes a law like AR-15-112 or, you know, racial profiling's okay, or English only, which was just recently introduced to the Minnesota legislature in the past session, then it's just somebody picking at the scabs. And people of color recoil from the desire to reconcile. So racism does tremendous, tremendous damage to everybody and to the peace and vibrancy of our entire society. I would also say this, you know, as we think and take stock of, of how far we really have come and get ready to celebrate the achievements of some really incredible people facing race today. And look how far we still have to go. I would say this, there is a lot at stake. You know, among the greatest damages of the, the law in Arizona is not just to the Hispanic, uh, or Hispanic Studies program in Tucson, it's actually to the, the white citizens who are being prepared for a fantasy land that will never exist, rather than the world in which they will have to live and operate. One in which being aware of and developing skills to deal with people of many different races and languages will be incredibly important for everything from business to education to political stability. And let's face it, diversity can pose a profound challenge for the sustainability and vibrancy of a democracy. At stake is our country and form of government. You remember those 77 kids killed in Norway? Who were all children of political party members who favored open immigration. You following what's happening in southern France where traditional Muslim attire is being outlawed for people to wear in public? Or the very xenophobic policies that are being implemented in Austria some of the most democratic countries in the world. Here in America, you can see like those laws in Arizona or the 32 states that are passing various forms of English only laws, that there is a real recoil 
against the demographic shift. And some people are kind of taking apartheid-like measures to preserve white privilege and power. And it has the potential to really tear us apart. So we need to think very hard and critically about where we're going. And I would say that the future vitality of our democracy depends upon this work. You know, the world is horribly, unconscionably unfair in so many different ways. That idea of American fairness and meritocracy, it's, it's a myth. And we need to realize something. I think people of color oftentimes get pretty darn angry. And boy, we got a lot of reasons to be angry. But let's face it, anger can eat us up like a cancer, too. And unfair though it might be, if there is anything that we value, that we need to work for, we all have to take responsibility for it and work for that ourselves. So for me, doing a lot of work with native language revitalization and so forth, we can't wait for somebody to hand that to us on a silver platter. Not that anybody could. We have to work for that and make that happen. If our tribes want to reacquire land, unfair though it might be, how it was taken, we'll go out and buy it back if we have to. We need to take responsibility on all of these things. By the way, I wanted to share very briefly the, the, first, the story of the first Ojibwe uh, immersion school in the United States, which is actually in our neighboring state of Wisconsin, Wadukudadi. The achievement gap that I think is on everybody in everybody's radar screen, at least the folks in this room, well, over there, it was about 50%. About 50% of Native youth were failing their state-mandated tests in English and in math. They said in their charter, we will develop a school that meets all state-mandated curriculum guides, guidelines, but we are going to do it all in the Ojibwe language. And for 12 years in a row, that school has had a 100% pass rate in state-mandated tests in English, <laughs> administered in English. And I think it says a lot of things. You know, my heroes are not your heroes. And kids going to school, learning all about the great heroes of the world, not yours. The great cultures of the world, not yours. All of that succeeds in engineering a powerful blow to self-esteem. But when people get to learn about themselves, as well as the rest of the world, that generates academic achievement in unbelievable ways. So to me, this is a very critical way to step forward. And it's everything from reforming No Child Left Behind to the state-mandated curriculum guidelines to what we are teaching and how we are teaching it and even the languages in which we disseminate that information to the children. By the way, if you will recall the successes of the Civil Rights Movement, and Martin Luther King Jr. was right about so many things, but he got his greatest traction as they were marching on Washington, D.C. with a quarter of a million people, and a large, significant percentage of those people were white. In fact, when we are addressing the issues of race, oftentimes we work in a microcosm, fighting our small battles one at a time. I think we'll overcome that Indian mascot thing when people of all races stand up and say, this is not tolerable. And the same with any of the other issues that we are facing in race today. So we are all in this together. We all have so much at stake. And I got to wrap this up real quick because we have to get on with the primary business of the night, which is honoring the incredible achievements of tonight's honorees. But I share briefly the story of this crazy white guy here, <laughs> Michael Muirs. And he said a very simple thing. You know, when I go to Hawaii, everybody knows what the word aloha means. When people come to Bemidji, they should all know what buju means and anin. And so he started going door to door 
and trying to convince area businesses to put up bilingual signs for bathrooms and produce and things like that. And it worked. Entirely grassroots. The public school system, the university, the regional events center, they've all put up bilingual signs. The majority of businesses in the town of Bemidji have put up bilingual signs. I was just in paying for my tires at and my white mechanic told me, <laughs> And you know, that doesn't solve all the big issues, but it opens the safe space where we can all address those bigger issues. And let's face it, whether it's guilt or anger, those emotions can so cloud the discussion that we can't get traction. We can't have everybody walking around on eggshells. We need to open safe space and we need to advance this discussion to get to those meaningful issues. So it did a lot. And then last year when I was honored here at, uh, at Facing Race, the stipend went to the bilingual signage effort and paid for all the signs in the public schools there in Bemidji. And so it just keeps on snowballing. So I think this organization Facing Race does a lot. And it's not just, you know, like that small grant, but I think it's the way it brings us all together. The way that these issues transcend our differences and the stake that we all have in facing race that we all need to be aware of. And I feel sobered and humbled by the amount of work that we have to do, but also very, very hopeful, inspired by the work of our honorees in particular and all of the other people who are out there facing race every day. And I just love this quote by Margaret Mead because I think it says so much, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Ahau mi guaych. Today I learned the word miigwech. Anybody want to try it with me? Miigwech. Miigwech. Sort of close? Sort of close. So thank you, Anton, for joining us tonight to celebrate leaders who share with you a vision of a better Minnesota, a Minnesota free of racism. I'd also like to thank um, a number of other people in the room who made tonight's award possible. First, we wouldn't be celebrating the sixth annual Ambassador Awards program if there wasn't an anonymous donor who thought we should do this. So you know who you are. Thank you very much. <clears throat> there are current and former members of the board who are here. There are current and former members of the Ambassador Award Committee. And there are people who have served on the Anti-Racism Task Force. Some of you for over 10 years. Would all of you stand up if you've been affiliated, please? Facing race actually began as an East Metro initiative, but we know that racial disparities um, harm communities all across the state and the country, of course. Well, unfortunately, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation gave us a major grant about a year and a half ago, a million eight, so we could extend this work across the state of Minnesota. Um, so if any of you want to sign up tonight to do a conversation with your group of friends, your church group, your work group, um, we have staff that can help you facilitate conversations. We're pleased to have people in this room who've come from across Min Minnesota, obviously Bemidji. Um, there's lots of folks from Rochester, saw some folks from Alexandria. Um, other cities want to call out? How about St. Paul? And that, that city across the, the river? Okay. We're also really pleased to welcome um, a number of policy makers and elected officials. And we may not have everybody in the room, but I'm going to mention those we know about. And if, if everyone will stand as I call your name, and then if you should have been called out, you stand up too, please. Representative Bobby Joe Champion, <clears throat> Dakota County Commissioner Tom Egan, and Tom attends this event every single year, <clears throat> Senator Linda Higgins. Minnesota Human Rights Commissioner Kevin Lindsay, 
Rochester Mayor Ardell Brady. Saw Ardell earlier. St. Paul Schools Superintendent Valeria De Silva. Saw you morning and night, Valeria. Secretary of State Mark Ritchie. I think I saw you walk in the room also. Hey, Mark. Thank you. Deputy Mayor of St. Paul, Paul Williams. And one of the past honorees, too. Um, Greg Bohr from Senator Amy Klobuchar's office. <laughs> Representative Tina Liebling. <laughs> Ramsey County Tony, T Ex Commissioner Tony Carter. <laughs> and St. Paul Schools Board Member Alona Street, Street Sewer, Stewart. Excuse me. Anybody else we should have called out? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Tina Moran. Rita Marino. Thank you. Sorry. Rita Moran. Thank you for helping me get that right. And I would love to take one moment and honor all the ambassadors and honorees from past years. If you joined us, would you all please stand up and let us thank you again for your work. Jan, are you still working with all those students? Absolutely. So thank you all very much for your work. It's now my pleasure to introduce the St. Paul Foundation's Facing Race um, team. Rosa Chip Chandler and Sharon Goins. These are the people who would work with you if you'd like to have a conversation with a group that you care about. And I encourage you to connect with them tonight. They're skilled and they're really compassionate facilitators who are ready to help individuals and organizations groups of friends and families start their conversations about racism or continue them. Please welcome Rosette and Sharon. There you go. Hello, I'm Rosette Ship Chandler. The St. Paul Foundation created the Facing Race Ambassador Awards six years ago to celebrate the hard work and often unheralded successes of individuals fighting for racial equity. Since 2007, 38 individuals have been recognized as award recipients and honorable mentions, raising the profile of their anti-racism work. And I'm Sharon Goins. Tonight we will recognize five more leaders, each working to build communities where everyone feels safe, valued, and respected. The St. Paul Foundation is pleased to recognize three outstanding individuals with, honorable, with Ambassador Award honorable mentions, Elizabeth Campbell, Tuniza Islam, and Gregory Stavrou. I am thankful to everybody. I am an unabashed communal, communalist. I'm a communalist. I believe in sharing everything <laughs> with other human beings that I may possess. I am the direct opposite of the idea of individualism in human society. I know that that's a guiding principle in American thought. I oppose it. <laughs> All human beings are creatures of culture. Human beings are social animals. They cannot live as human beings outside of a social context. That is impossible to be human <laughs> and be purely individualist. That's not possible. I know that rankles a lot of people, and I love to do that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Off of the top of my head, I can think of at least 10 other people who are far more deserving of this recognition than I. And yet I am grateful for this recognition. I'm quite aware of the fact that in so honoring me, you are saluting my fellow workers, associates, and supporters. In short, the St. Paul Foundation is acknowledging my community, acknowledging the hood. <laughs> the
the hood and its friends, and others who are earnestly engaged in the long and arduous struggle for social justice in America. Racism is the most intractable of all of our nation's social problems. It has been a major dynamic in American society since the inception of the American Republic. The Founding Fathers assured us of this birth defect. <laughs> That's what it is. The Founding Fathers, many of them, were classical white supremacists. <laughs> and I start with Thomas Jefferson. I advance it as a suspicion only. That <laughs> that whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, the blacks are inferior to the whites, both in the endowments of the mind and body. That's a classical statement by Thomas Jefferson. And if I'm to believe what George Wills, a very conservative man, believes, and I believe what he said, even though I'd like not to be caught in the same room with him. George Will said that everything that's true is derivative and everything that's not is false. I believe that. <laughs> Ideas don't have color or political positions. That's what I believe. <laughs> that everything that's true in this world is derived from something. It doesn't come out of the sky that human beings do. So the Founding Fathers were the authors of what we are living out, this idea of race. This act that they put in the Constitution is found in the very first article, Section 1, Article 1, Section 3, Paragraph 2. This essential fact that in that article, black people were defined as three-fifths of other persons. The only such people in the world who had been both property and people at the same time. Black people were seen as property up until 1865. Officially, <laughs> they were excluded from the human race. We have to understand that, that American people in the generality know very little about America because they only know the even surface and not the uneven bottom. The essential facts in the Constitution, the first article, that is to say, the past never really passes. <laughs> That's William Faulkner, another white supremacist, a great author, but nevertheless a white supremacist. I agree with that statement because <laughs> it doesn't have a color. The past never passes. You can't get past the past, Jack. <laughs> ever since then, ever since they set the pace, the myth of race and the reality of racism has been a drag on the moral development of America. And the moral struggle is at the heart of the fight for democracy in America. Racism is a blatant enemy of the ideals of democracy. Let us call on the wisdom and compelling words of Judge William Hasty, the first black American appointed to a federal judgeship, who was also the first cousin of Thurgood Marshall. <laughs> Judge Hasty says to us his incredible words. Democracy is a process and not a static condition. It is be, not being, not being, but becoming. It can be easily lost and never fully won. And its essence is eternal struggle. That's what I think about democracy. It's about struggle. If there's no struggle, there is no progress, said Frederick Douglass. 
absolutely a democratic statement. <laughs> it's not fixed in a position that you can ship to Iraq. That's impossible. <laughs> you can't ship it to Harlem. <laughs> I'm, th I know. I'm thoroughly convinced that the problems that are generated by the false consciousness of race can be solved. What is made by humankind be, can be unmade by humankind. And I'm equally convinced that nothing can be solved that can't be faced. Nothing can be solved that can't be faced. I wish again to commend the St. Paul Foundation, however belated for its institutional and creative response to the ill deeds generated by the ideology of white supremacy. And it is an ideology. It's not a color. White is not a color, it's a state of mind. It's even a moral choice. Sad to say, this reality is more American than flags, baseball, or apple pie. Finally, I would like to challenge our young people, the youth of every color and ethnicity, to struggle themselves as individuals and with and among their, peer, their peers to understand this doctrine, this doctrine, white supremacy is which spoils every virtue that our nation holds dear. It is the enemy of human progress. Further, you must struggle to understand that we are not put on this earth simply and only to be happy. <laughs> That's a major American affliction, happiness. <laughs> <laughs> Television watching and playing video games is not the whole of the story of life. There's a higher reality, a higher purpose to being a conscious human being. And that is why we call on you young people to be responsible to be useful, to be compassionate, to count for something, to make it matter that you lived it all. Each generation out of relative obscurity must discover its own mission and either fulfill it or betray it. The charge is yours. We who are products, people my age, who came out of the 60s and who are proud products of the Civil Rights Movement didn't meet our moral assignment. <laughs> yes, we did. We got rid of the ugliest face of racism, what Dr. Du Bois called a series of little meannesses of humiliating people publicly on the buses and the train stations, the toilets and the restaurants. Racism is a public evil which causes private pain. That's what it is, y'all. <laughs> it's a legal, cultural, historical phenomenon that we must get rid of. And I charge all of us to first examine yourself. As Socrates said, an unexamined life is a life not worth living. We need to examine ourselves. I know I took up too much time. And I understand, I apologize. I, I apologize. I have a kinship with Native Americans. I don't go to any, and I've been to many, many Native American meetings. My friend, you are brilliant. The one thing I always do when I go to Native, Native American meetings is I know I'm going to sit for a while. <laughs> And I don't mind. And the reason why they talk so long because they have not been allowed to talk, to speak. <laughs> right. I like that. We are kindred spirits. We come from an improvisational culture. I'm sorry, America. <laughs> I'm sorry about being improvisational. <laughs> Where you fit this over there and that over there and you can't be anywhere but there. No. <laughs> so thank you.
you know, not the foundation, but the people who are representing, and thank you very much. I want you to know, it sounds strange because I don't sound that way. But I love people. <laughs> I really do. <laughs> of any color. <laughs> One more thing. I just want you to know, Lee, that, that love really at bottom is an act of the will. Okay. We now honor Steve Peterson, executive leadership team member of the Diversity Resource Action Alliance, serving Alexandria and central Minnesota. In addition to his volunteer work with the Alliance, Steve is a farmer raising soybeans and cattle about 20 miles southwest of Alexandria. He has lived his whole life in rural Minnesota and knows well the challenges small towns face when it comes to creating a truly diverse and welcoming community. Since adopting the first of his two African American children seven years ago, Peterson has become an impassioned and tireless advocate for tolerance and racial equity. He facilitates workshops and trainings for regional advocacy groups and works with Minnesota state colleges and universities to address issues of recruitment and retention of students of color and first generation students. He is a founding member of Alexandria's Cultural Inclusiveness Committee, advising the Alexandria City Council on matters of diversity and inclusion. He dedicates a significant amount of personal time to creating communities that embrace and nurture diversity. The St. Paul Foundation is honored to recognize the work and personal commitment of Steve Peterson. As our Minnesota Award Ambassador Award recipient, Steve will receive a $10,000 grant made in his name to the organization of his choice. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Peterson. First, I'd like to say thank you to the St. Paul Foundation, um, the staff of Facing Race, everyone here, and especially my friends who, uh, who uh, I wouldn't be here without them. Um, I'd also like to thank my family. Without the support of my wife, Joanne, my kids, Valencia and Alan, and my parents, this would not be possible. Tonight, I stand among many deserving colleagues and friends, and it is truly an honor to be with you. Each of our personal stories have brought us together tonight through many different paths. My story is unique and so is yours. As a young person, I noticed the different ways people were treated because of the color of their skin. But it wasn't until years later that I began to realize the extent of the problem. How racism negatively affects all of us, regardless of skin color. I stand here today because anti-racism, activism, and leadership has many different faces. Each of us has different roles to fill, a unique niche. I have come to know and am working to end racism in rural Minnesota. My motivation for doing this work began by advocating for my children and continues to evolve and expand today. Today is a milestone, but not a finish line. Thank you for this honor and for the challenge to continue this important work. Thank you, Mahmoud and Steve. You show us that tremendous change is possible when we commit to working together to move the conversation about racism forward. Both Mahmoud and Steve were kind enough to tell us about some of the books and authors that have inspired their work. If you didn't pick one up earlier, you can find their recommended reading list at the Facing Race table in the lobby. This is what it looks like. 
Now I'd like to introduce the chair of the St. Paul Foundation Board, Joan Jervinsky. Joan is a retired president and district manager for Wells Fargo and a respected civic leader. Joan has always been a passionate advocate for social justice. She has served on a number of community boards, including the Amherst H. Wilder Foundation, the Central Corridor Partnership, Health East, the St. Paul Port Authority, and the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. She was a founding member of the St. Paul Foundation's Anti-Racism Advisory Committee, which helped launch the Facing Race Initiative. Please welcome Joan Jervinsky. Thank you, Rosette and Sharon. Um, the script here says, I am honored to be here tonight, and that just doesn't say it totally. Um, when Anton was up and he talked about recharging batteries, I thought, you know, that's it. And uh, of course, our fabulous musicians, I mean, my heart was like jumping out of my chest. And then I listened to our other honorees, and um, the, I've got so many emotions, it's, it's just hard to talk about them. But I know that this was the right place to be tonight. And so thanks to all of you for being here as members of a community of activists. That's who you are. Activists who refuse to accept the way things are. While Minnesota is recognized as one of the healthiest, most vibrant states in the nation, not all Minnesotans experience the same quality of life. And our communities cannot function at their full potential if racial disparities persist in employment, housing, health, and education. We know that the best ideas for solving problems in a community most often come from the community. In February, the Minnesota Community Foundation launched its third Minnesota Idea Open Challenge. It was titled Working Together Across Cultures and Face in partnership with One Nation, a national organization that works with foundations across the country to connect diverse communities on a local level. This idea challenge asked individuals to share their best thoughts for building bonds and working together across cultures and faiths. Three winning ideas will each receive $15,000 to implement their ideas. Two runners-up will receive $5,000 each to carry their ideas forward. The response to the idea challenge was amazing. More than 600 individuals submitted ideas. And in May, you can vote for what you think is the best idea. Go to minnesotaideaopen.org. I'd also like to tell you about Racial Equity Minnesota. It's a new statewide coalition of organizations that provide racial equity training and technical assistance for communities that want to address racism. The St. Paul Foundation's Facing Racial Init Initiative is a proud member of this, and I encourage you to learn more about the Racial Equity Network members that are featured on the back of your program, and please take your program with you. Tonight we celebrate not only our honorees, but all of you. It is your voices, your commitment, and your hard work that will create a Minnesota of which we can all be proud. Just think about what you heard tonight and how that may change how you think or how you feel about um, things that you see and, and witness going forward. And we're going to ask something of you. Um, the food was really good. And by the way, I, I would like to thank everybody who put this amazing event together. Uh, the mus musicians were fabulous. The food was fabulous. Uh, the people who work at uh, St. Paul Foundation are all doing God's work. Um, so thank you. But now we're going to ask something of you. We need your help to help carry the conversation forward. Carlene will join me now in a facing race call to action. There is no such, free thi such thing as a free hors d'oeuvre. <laughs> Yeah, so we're going to ask you to do some work. We're actually going to let you get stand up. And in a few minutes, you can just go off and mingle and do what you want. But you have to make some commitments along the way. There's a, a little um, um, check card. 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 There's a conversation forward card. And take a look at it. You'll see a bunch of action steps that you can take um, so that you can help this community feel more safe, more valued, more respected, everyone in it. So we're going to read the list and ask you to stand up individually when you're going to commit to that action. 
Stay standing. There's another idea. Maybe some more of you will stand up on the second one. So let's just get going and see how this works. And I think we need some drumming help. Yeah, if my heart starts beating really fast again, it'll be really hard. Thank you. Now, the script says just one thing, but I'm going to say you can actually volunteer to do more than one if you'd like. It's a great list. Let's start at the top. Who in this room might be willing to host a facing race dialogue or anti-racism training in your community or in your workplace? Stand up, please. All right. There's some, oh, oh, wow. Woo. This is really cool. Thank Whoa. you. Who will write a letter to the editor or contact a news director when you see negative r racial stereotypes in the media? Please stand. And we know there's lots of opportunity for that one. Here's a good one. Look around this room and around your community and nominate someone for the 2013 Facing Race Ambassador Awards. I'll do this. Will you join me? Stand up if you're going to nominate somebody. Who will le learn a few words or phrases from one of the many languages now spoken in Minnesota? Please stand, OK? Thank you. Miigwake. That's Carlene's new word, but she's still Miigwake. working at it. <laughs> Anton will help me. <laughs> Who will vote for their favorite idea to bridge cultures and face in the Minnesota Idea Open Challenge this May? Please stand. And you just have to think of it. 600 people have put forward ideas to win $15,000 to, to implement their idea to cross faiths and cultures. How many of you have ever voted for an American Idol person dancing with the stars? This is a way more important competition. You should go vote. Go vote. OK, who's going to pledge to learn more about the anti-racism initiatives offered by the Racial Equity Network folks. Is there anybody still sitting down? You want to read that list and go to the website and check them out. I see a few people out there, Carly. OK. <laughs> OK, here's, here's one. Who will tell someone about this event in the Facing Race program? Now, how hard is that? Please stand up. Or to, or to t talk about Mahmoud or Steve or the other award winners, how hard is that to go out and tell somebody the great attention we brought? So anyway, I just wanted to ask you, look around at the room of friends you've got here. There's some people you can dance with, it looks like. The energy and commitment that you share makes me feel really confident that together we can move the conversation forward to end racism. Can you imagine that? What a dream. We could end racism. If you want a reminder of the commitment you're making on this form, just drop it in the box and the staff will contact you and find out if you still really want to do that thing you said and you can mark it. So on behalf of everyone at the St. Paul Foundation, I hope this evening has restored your spirit, renewed your energy to go out and do this hard work, and spe special thanks for the, the Dunia group who will send us on our way tonight. And again, miigwech. Oh, and don't forget your parking ticket. You should have gotten it if you registered. If you didn't, you get a big discount at the